to I hope it's I hope it's yeah no, that's fine yeah okay. no problem I'm just making sure that it's recording uh right. yeah it is recording it looks like it's recording okay well good Thanks. morning and um I'm interviewing or I'm speaking to having a conversation with Rohan Petiagudra uh, from Sydney, Australia. Um, so um, I, I've got about five books of uh, Rohan Petiagudra with me near my desk that are really heavy to pick up and uh, I, I might not be able to refer to all of them, but I've got plenty more in the background and Rohan has done a huge amount of work uh, writing and authoring and promoting biodiversity in Sri Lanka. So um, can I ask you, Rohan, are you uh, trapped in Australia or, or, uh, because of the current situation, uh, lockdown and coronavirus? Oh, no, I'm not trapped. I'm, I'm here voluntarily. Um, okay. it's, it's easier for me to work here because there's uh, a lot less COVID in, in Australia. It's much better managed uh, than most other countries. And so it, it gives me the freedom to get about and uh, have a normal life while, while getting on with my work. And are you at the Australian uh, Museum, uh, if I may ask? Um, substantively, yes, except that right now the museum isn't open for people like me for research. Um, that's due to change next week on the 28th. And I think there's, uh, there'll probably be an announcement that we can go back in and uh, work in the labs. But yes. For the past six months or so, it's, it hasn't happened. I understand you're going to be having a new um, dinosaur gallery and uh, all sorts of new galleries opening there. Um, yes. Yeah. The, the museum's gone through a major facelift and uh, it's now already open to the public um, and people are, people are coming in. And it's, it's a fantastic museum as a natural history museum, rather like the one in London. Um, there's no entrance fee. And so a lot of young people come and spend a lot of time there, which is, which is really nice to see. And if I may ask you, are you, um, a member of the staff of the museum. Uh, no, I'm, an associate I'm, a member. Associate. I'm a research associate, which means I, I work in a voluntary capacity. I don't get paid, um, but I have the freedom to go in and, and work on the collections and use the library and the museum's facilities, um, which is fantastic, which is all I want. And yes. that's because I'm retired. So um, I think I just want to keep this as spontaneous as possible because if I was to try to implement any kind of agenda or talk about some of my concerns which have pr prompted this interview or this conversation, I'd probably, uh, well, I, I, fear, I fear the consequences. Let's just put it that way. So uh, in the history of biodiversity, most of the greatest uh, naturalists in the past, uh, people like uh, Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace were private individuals who were paying for their own research as opposed to these modern day scientists who uh, uh, constantly need to get grants and uh, all kinds of uh, um, support from various organizations. Um, are we at a time when, uh, because there's so little money for conservation that uh, there's a kind of trend or any kind of movement towards um, uh, bio biodiversity specialists uh, paying for their own research? I think this is a difficult one. Darwin came from a quite wealthy family he never needed to work for a living in his whole life. And he, uh, it, it's a wonderful gift to science that he had the money with which to do his research and his writing. Um, and and he, he was a prodigious worker. He was not a gentleman and kind of an armchair naturalist. He was very much an experimental naturalist, an aspect of Darwin that is often overlooked. Sadly, no one has written up the hundreds of experiments that he conducted, many of which he never published but many of which are also well documented. Um, it would be lovely to see a book one day about Darwin's experiments because um, he was probably the first proper experimental biologist, ecologist, and evolutionary scientist in, in, uh, at a scale which few people appreciate. Uh, Wallace, on the other hand, was relatively badly off. Uh, he had to work quite hard to get to where he was. Um, but he's, he still got by um, as a collector and a field worker and author and such. Um, in the modern world, you can't expect people to do that because inherited wealth is no longer uh, commonplace. We all have to get used to the idea that we have to work for a living. And uh, winning grants to do our work is also a good thing because uh, to an extent, these grants mean that we have to compete for a common pool of money. Um, and it means that you have to do sensible work. So um, lazy work or uh, 
in work that isn't really valuable often gets put to the bottom. It means that you can't be as speculative as you'd like, but I, I don't see anything fundamentally wrong with the grant rewarding process that most scientists in the world really have to contend with. Would you say that this process, uh, the historical situation benefits from the fact that there was so much waiting to be uh, discovered compared to uh, the modern day situation? And also there was probably more of a mania for natural history in the Victorian period and there were absolutely no restrictions on collecting or any kind of activity like that. And it was also an age of exploration. Yes, very much. Um, there's, there's a, uh, it, it's a very fundamentally European thing to go out and look uh, for things to explore, to climb the highest mountain, to, to swim the deepest sea kind of thing. This is very much part of the European ethos. It isn't that so much in South Asia. Um, if you think about it in, in my language, in Singhala, there, there isn't even a word, a proper word for an explorer. The, the word that we use is actually derived from uh, searching for cattle. Um, so it, it gives you a background for the, the mindset of people. It's only in recent generations that the idea of exploration has got on uh, in the popular imagination. Otherwise, this has always been seen as a Western pursuit, as indeed is science. So, so mainstreaming biodiversity science or any kind of science into our societies has, has been a challenge and that transformation is only happening right now in, in our time. It, it hasn't really been part of our culture until quite recently. Well, I'm going to be putting, putting you on the spot and taking a slightly different perspective, if I may. Um, I have uh, identified two main stages of uh, Asian history, if you like. One of them is the pre-European history and one of them is the post-colonial history. Um, it has been pointed out by a, a certain spiritual guru of mine that, um, um, that there are only two places in the world where elephants have survived. Uh, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, elephants used to be found all around in all the great continents, but they effectively disappeared, uh, mainly because of human activity, I think. I mean, they were found in North America, South America, most of Asia, most of Europe but they only survived in two parts of the world. One of them is Africa and one of them is Southeast Asia. The reason they survived in Africa was that they had evolved with human beings, but the reason that they survived in Asia was that the king gave them protection and they provided some kind of use. So they were used for war and work and obviously because of some kind of royal protection, the elephants carried on. Um, now, I would just like to say that this kind of, uh, act, I mean, the protection of the elephant for practical reasons was probably a part of Sri Lankan culture for thousands of years. And I just want to know to what extent, at least from the point of view of elephants, has Southeast Asian culture theoretically promoted uh, at least forests and big animals like elephants? I mean, there's something special that elephants did survive in Southeast Asia because maybe they were used in some way, maybe they had a some kind of relationship with human beings. Do you, what, what do you think about this on the basis of the fact that you have actually written a huge tome about Asian elephants? Oh, no, I haven't. I've published one. Actually, I've, I've never actually worked on elephants. I helped publish a book uh, for another author, but I haven't uh, myself worked on elephants. But I, I do have a view, nevertheless. Um, and this is, this is not my own thinking, but it's derived from largely from the thinking of uh, Preeti Viraj Fernando, who, who is an elephant expert, but I've spent many hours talking about elephants with him as a matter of interest. Um, I, I think you, the, the, the view that you just projected was, was if I might say so, it's, it's rather simplistic. Um, the, the, the idea is, I don't think it's fair to say that elephants benefited from being protected or large animals benefited from being protected. The elephants were certainly utilized, but if you look at, for example, the gar, um, which probably was in, in Sri Lanka, we know that gar uh, bones are found in, in caves um, in Sri Lanka from um, the, the, the Stone Age, from maybe at least thousands of years ago. We have at least one historical record of the gar in Sri Lanka from Robert Knox's book. He describes the animal very accurately. Um, and that, that the last gower that's recorded in Sri Lankan history was actually in the possession of uh, the king of Kandy. Um, so to, to say that 
the, the elephant survived and the Gawa didn't because the elephant was in some way useful and the Gawa wasn't. I'm not convinced. I mean, maybe it's true, maybe it's not, but we can cherry pick any number of instances like this. The yes. reasons for the loss of the megafauna from places like Australia um, and uh, North America, and to some extent from Europe, because Europe had a, the aura of the, the large uh, ox in, in um, Europe was also lost um, in the last few thousand years. So animal extinctions have been commonplace, and I don't think we can point to particular reasons and without evidence. We shouldn't point to particular instances of animals that survived and say that was because of some kind of royal protection. Not convinced by that. The, the second thing is that we probably didn't have as many elephants as we've had in recent decades in historical times, because elephants, elephant densities in heavily forested countries or, or areas tends tend to be lower than in areas with vast uh, amounts of grassland. The elephants are basically grass-eating uh, herbivores. And in this context, Sri Lanka now has 200 or 1,000 hectares of the most nutritious grasses you can find in, in the form of uh, rice paddy. And so the elephants have been given a perfect habitat. If you think about it, the elephant wants lots of food and lots of water you know, to wallow in. And we've created 10,000 odd small tanks in villages and 250,000 hectares of rice paddies. If this is elephant heaven uh, for all practical purposes. It's not, yeah. So it's not surprising that we have a large number of elephants because we've got a large and very nutritious, perfect habitat for elephants. On the one hand, we give them protection on the other, which is fantastic. Of course, a lot of elephants get killed and people are killed by elephants and I'm not denying that there's a human elephant conflict. But we have to see how our landscape and our habitats have evolved as well. Um, because if we had the amount of rainforest as we did a thousand years ago or in pre-agricultural times, we probably wouldn't have hosted that many elephants. If you look at heavily densely forested parts of Asia, Elephant densities tend to be quite low. So this mixed matrix of, of, of Sweden cultivation, you know, the, the slash and burn Shana cultivation, which means that every year with the onset of the rains, you have this massive uh, bursting out of foliage, which is great for the elephants. The rice cultivation, the large numbers of tanks that have been built, all would benefit an elephant population. So it doesn't mean that elephants are targeted as uh, as the objects of conservation. Yeah, well, well that's very, very I interesting. Uh, but what I, I'd just like to say, at least uh, I'm sure that you'd, you, I mean, would like to have some feedback. Um, if we look at uh, images from uh, colonial British times and uh, historical records, we notice just how, how much more elephants were integrated into human society, or at least, um, at least to uh, uh, helping and assisting aristocratic people uh, for example, in situations of war. For example, I've seen a picture, I'm sure that you've seen it as well, of an elephant plowing in Sri Lanka. So elephants might have been used at a certain point for plowing. And also the elephant kraals were carrying on unbelievably almost as late as uh, the 1950s when they were captured. And there are lots of images of them being trained and uh, you know harnessed with things and tortured a little bit. Uh, people like uh, Emerson Tennant have written books about this. Uh, so elephants were part of Sri Lankan culture and also Asian culture in a way that we just don't really realize now. I mean, there are some stunning images from Thailand as well of, of strings of elephants carrying, uh, I don't know, queens on their backs. Uh, we don't really get that, those sorts of images from Sri Lanka, but it must have happened that there would have been times when uh, elephant, elephants carried royalty on their backs, or alternately they were pulling uh, huge carts. Um, so elephants were part of, uh, the culture in South Asia, including Sri Lanka, for the long time in a way that is not understood now. And is there any kind of rule for uh, bringing back elephants or, or any other animals uh, in assisting hu humans, despite all this, um, all this talk about animal cruelty? I think the welfare of animals is something that everyone's pretty much committed to now. I certainly am. Um, and the idea of uh, wild animals being used uh, even for performances, like uh, the 
the orcas being used in these circuses and the, the west uh, or elephants being used in circuses at the worldwide um, is is just bad form um, i think to use a wild animal for as, as a performing uh, animal is, is just plain wrong um, it is unnatural and it's something that we shouldn't do so i wouldn't support bringing new wild animals into uh, the, the uh, wouldn't i would object to their being used for purposes like that I, I wouldn't like that i certainly wouldn't support it what about things like uh, elephant back tourism safaris that sort of thing um, why would you need to do this i mean if people want entertainment they should watch netflix this is not the right thing to do you you shouldn't have to capture a wild animal and train it for uh, months on end so that it can carry a bunch of tourists on its back this is this is silly do you um, think that yes do you think that I elephant don't, I don't, I don't okay all right it. do you think that elephant back safaris i mean they're used in india for example tiger safaris things like that uh, do you yeah. think that there are any advantages or disadvantages in using there was a time when sooty was used in india we very very throw the the widow of somebody who died into the funeral pile yeah. yes that's not to say it's right the fact that people do something doesn't make it right they 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 still stone gay people in some countries that doesn't make it right yes so I... my, my my point is that just because some people have certain behaviors it doesn't mean that we need to follow i think we need to set the bar a bit higher for ourselves well, in Africa, they don't use elephants for any kind of uh, safari um, activity, but I think that in India, they African still elephants are a little less tractable than the Asian ones. I think that's that's probably. yes. They're not easily easily. They're not as docile. Uh, now, I know I, this is a total digression, but just to kind of tease out something, uh, the one the one record of uh, elephant use in history in Africa that we have is uh, when Hannibal was attacking. Uh, uh, room uh, using elephants and uh, we understand from some of the records that that was probably not uh, an Indian elephant but at the same time uh, it could have been a subspecies of elephant that has now disappeared. Do you have any ideas or views about that? No, not, none at all. No. Uh, what I know the story but I haven't, I haven't done any research into that. Um, do you have any views about, uh, for example, there's recently been some talk in this kind of context of uh, I mean, Thailand, they employ uh, macaque monkeys to uh, bring down coconuts, and there's been a hoo-ha about it that it's uh, cruel. Uh, do you think that there is um, that, um, what do you think about using animals for things like that, of, of like, for example, bringing down fruit? Uh, I mean, see, there's a kind of spectrum between like exploiting animals and using them like slaves versus uh, animals like cats and dogs that have hardly got to do anything, uh, but they still obviously uh, have some kind of relationship with us. So there has to be a spectrum. And in order to justify uh, or maybe encourage some kind of uh, cross-species cooperation, we have to think about integrating animals into, our, um, uh, into how we live. So in this context, do you have any thoughts about these monkeys being used for, pulling, uh, for picking coconuts or anything like that? No, I don't. And I can't see the point of, of that kind of enterprise. I, I don't find it attractive. Um, the idea of work animals, I think, is disappearing everywhere in the world. The trend is against it. Um, the Industrial Revolution is all about not doing that kind of thing. And I can't see why we should try to reverse history by going into exploiting animals to do these things. I'm not very strong on animal rights uh, um, myself. I have I have strong personal views, but I have never advocated these things publicly, um, simply because the opportunity hasn't created itself. But since you're asking me the question, I mean, I, I feel strongly about even issues like uh, stray dogs. Uh, in, in Sri Lanka, as you know, these so-called community dogs or strays are everywhere on the streets. And the thing is, the dog has been bred through maybe the last 10 or 15,000 years as a companion to humans. Dogs bond very easily with us. And the whole idea that you can have a stray on the street, uncared for by anybody, is really painful to me. But many animal rights people even object to such dogs being sterilized because they feel the dog has a right to live on the street. But dogs have been bred to live with humans in the care of humans. Uh, the whole idea of man's best friend is lost if man's best friend has to live on the street. And so, so I, I go a step further even than many of the animal rights people in, in finding their views distasteful because my view is that the dog is the companion of people 
and never to be abandoned on the street. Uh, but isn't it the case, Rohan, that, for example, from Hogarth's paintings from London, uh, from, shall we say, the 18th century, stray dogs were, to, were the common feature in, like most places uh, with cities. Uh, and it's, I wouldn't say that they're the, they're the natural part of uh, stray cities, but at, at a certain level of economic development, stray dogs, uh, stray dogs are common, and then they kind of disappear as, as people become more uh, health conscious. So... It do I understand that you're advocating returning to the 18th century? That means cholera, smallpox, famine. Is that all what you're asking for? Yes. Well, actually, that's a very interesting. Actually, what I'm trying to kind of think about is like what at the moment there's a situation of like uh, people, everybody's talking about global warming and reducing uh, the use of fossil fuels. I am at least thinking about uh, the practical. I mean, for example, there's a family, I, I came across an article of a family who uh, started using horse carriages again uh, because uh, the fuel prices were too high for them. I'm just saying uh, at the moment, for example, at least when it comes to architecture in places like Singapore, they're integrating uh, biodiversity into cities. They're bringing in more and more forests into the architecture. For example, they're having green roofs, green balconies, green walls. I think this is a wonderful trend and uh, we are kind of probably seeing uh, less of a mentality of us and them. We're trying to bring the them to us. Um, now, so with, with regards to plants, uh, things, I think very interesting things are happening, you know, like vertical gardening, that kind of thing. But uh, is there any, any role for bringing in wild animals into, uh, I mean, apart from, for example, horrible things like pets or something, is there a role for wild animals, uh, is there a role that wild animals can play in our lives uh, a little bit like some of these plants and uh, forests creeping into uh, Singapore? Well, if you think about it, wild animals in the form of aquarium fishes are probably the world's most popular hobby. Uh, that's the point of contact that most children uh, have with the, the world of animals is a fish tank or a fish, a goldfish pool. Um, and so this is a, a very important thing. I think it, it gives children the immediate uh, ability to, to play with an animal, to, to care for an animal, find out when an animal is sick and, uh, or healthy and so on. So I, I, I favor that kind of contact, but I think you have to be careful about blowing this up too much. The, the idea of returning to the horse and the cart, I think is frankly silly um, because the, the whole idea of trying to reverse history has never been successful and it doesn't lead anywhere. Um, the Stone Age didn't end because, and, and, and move on to the Bronze and the Iron Age because people kept fighting to go back to using stone. They started using bronze and iron because they were better, they got the job done. And they allowed civilization to progress. You can have a horse and cart for fun, if you like, it's a, a, a curiosity, but certainly it's not going to lead to the, the advancement of mankind. It's not going to lead to prosperity, pulling people out of poverty. It's not going to lead to better education or healthcare for people. And these are the things that matter. These are the things that I want to pay attention to. Um, an eccentric person having a horse and cart means nothing. This is, this is a, an outlier. Well, I, I mean, I do agree with you. I'm simply um, sort of bringing some ideas up. Uh, but what are, the, what are the roles that wild animals have in, mod in the modern day world, apart from simply uh, taking a starring role in uh, wildlife documentaries? Uh, I mean, we could start with something like tourism. Uh, but recently it has been revealed by, by the work of people like Asha DeVos that, uh, for example, blue whales at least play a very important role in uh, recycling uh, marine nutrients and bringing nutrients from the bottom of the sea to the surface where plankton and other fish can benefit uh, as well as the whales. Um, do do um, big wild animals still have a useful role to play in modern day human society? I don't subscribe to that view actually. Maybe they do, maybe they don't, but I don't think that's an interesting question because the, the, the mindset that results in people thinking of biodiversity in terms of its utilitarian value, I think is a very Western mindset. And I don't subscribe to that. The, the idea that only things that have utility and value deserve to prosper and succeed I think is a very cynical and very Western uh, idea. This is, this is not an idea where I come from. Um, it, the, the idea that in Buddhist teaching, for example, and not a, I'm not a Buddhist, but I, I think there's a lot of good stuff in Buddhism, um, 
the idea of Buddhist teaching is, for example, that you respect all of life. It's not about respecting valuable life. It's, it's the universe of living things that you respect and you care for. If you only care for the things you, that have value, you'd live in a very cynical world. Why would we need grandparents in a, in a world that only respects value? Why don't we have euthanasia for grandparents or mothers in law? What earthly use is there in a mother in law? Because she's bred your, your wife, why would you need a mother in law? This idea of utility, I think, is really stupid. If you, if you analyze it carefully, it makes no sense. And I, I, I think we want to live in a world that is beautiful for its own sake, that to have aesthetic values and moral values that are beautiful in, them, in themselves, and not because they have economic value. I have no time for this. And, and this, this is part of the reason why I object to the Convention on Biological Diversity. Because in 1992, the whole world went in a massive stampede to sign up to the idea that we will conserve biodiversity because there's millions of dollars in it. First of all, there, were, there wasn't any millions of dollars in it. This was, this was a, a hoax. I, I don't like to use that word because Mr. Trump has copyrighted it. But it was a hoax because all these uh, promises, now 30 years later, the promises of materials transfer agreements and finding uh, cancer curing genes and biodiversity has, has turned out to be a false promise. We're three decades into this and nothing's really happened. Um, so this, this idea of equating biological wealth with financial wealth is, is a con, and I don't think we should go there. If I'm, if I'm wrong, show me the evidence. That there's simply no evidence to suggest that anyone, any company even has made money from this. I mean, the, the Costa Rican government, which has a huge uh, biodiversity assets, uh, set up a special uh, institute in Bio to look at plant chemicals. They assayed literally thousands of species of rainforest plants in Costa Rica. And at the end of what, 20 years of hard work, not a single compound was found of commercial value. So we, we look at a few examples like Wincristine from this Madagascan periwinkle or any number of any from, we pick from a small number, maybe a two or three dozen plants in the world out of the hundreds of thousands of species of plants for a few that have economic value. I mean, how many plants do we eat for goodness sake? I, less than 30 species are eaten. In, in common, if you go to a market, we have 30 or 40 species of plants, not, not thousands. So, but we conserve the thousands because we want to have them for their own sake, not because they have value. So this idea that we conserve what has value, I think is silly. It's a European colonial idea that has been foisted on, uh, on the tropical world. And this is a, this is a falsehood. What about, a, what about the use of wildlife or what about the basis of wildlife as the foundation for a, a thriving tourist industry? If, do you have to really exploit animals for a thriving tourist industry? There was a time when dog fights or cock fights were thought of as being entertainment for people and very important to local economies. We don't do it because it's wrong. Why would you want to do that? I, I can't see. I mean, where's the logic in doing something just because there's demand for it? If tourists want to do that kind of thing, they should go to a country that does it. I mean, it's a bit like sport hunting. Would you, would you, would you espouse trophy hunting, for example? That's, that's, that's probably a good example. I, I think it's disgusting, but mm. many people would say that's one way of recovering uh, or putting money into conservation is to, for tourists to come and hunt trophies. Remember in Sri Lanka, we are killing what, 250 elephants a year now from, from farmers are killing? What, what, why don't we get Americans to come and pay what, $50,000 for shooting an elephant? You kill the 250 and get some revenue to the country. Is that what you want to do? Well, I mean, in a kind of slightly more uh, cogent way, I mean, is there any hope for, uh, for example, the big, big wildlife of uh, African, uh, African savannas if it wasn't for tourism? Why would that be the case? If, if things are important to mankind as a resource, it's our job to fund, the, to put the money in that makes that possible. I don't think we do a lot of other things based on tourism. Otherwise, child sex trafficking would be a wonderfully sustainable business. Mm. There are children dying of starvation. Why not sell them as sex slaves? You mm. don't do that. It's not the commercial value that matters. It's, we have to have moral principles on which we found our societies, not on commercial values. Mm. 
Well, at, at the moment, for example, people like Edward Wilson have developed uh, ideas like Half Earth. And uh, there was a trend recently, at least before COVID, when more and more people were gathering up in cities. Uh, the smart money is uh, on the proposition that actually human populations and fertilities have already started dropping. So maybe in a kind of slightly utopian kind of vision, uh, there is uh, at least uh, conceivably uh, an idea that maybe wildlife will have more space in the future and uh, we could become more efficient in our agricultural methods and that the world can, can be devoted and dedicated uh, back towards wildlife. So is this an ideal we should be aiming for? That's already the case, Radhik. If you think about it, between 1960 and now, in my lifetime, Sri Lanka's uh, agricultural productivity in terms of rice has gone up four and a half times, uh, acre for acre. We, we, the, the Green Revolution was such, thanks to Ernst Borlaug, that it, it has been possible now with these new varieties and breeds of rice and the fertilizers that we use now uh, to, to make land hugely productive. And remember, our population during that time has gone up by more than double. Mm. Even as, and when I was a kid, I can remember going and standing in line for the weekly ration of rice that the government allowed you to buy because there was such a shortage. Now you don't hear of such shortages. When I was a kid, there were famines in Ethiopia and Eritrea and in India, massive famines, millions of people dying. You don't hear of that now. You don't hear of that now because technology has made it possible for us to produce more from less. And this is a hugely valuable transformation that has happened on Earth. I don't think you need to think about physically setting aside things, the, the most important, uh, setting aside land. The most important thing we need to focus on is fixing the problem of poverty. When people are well off, they pay more attention to the environment. That's why Europe is much cleaner than it was a hundred years ago. They pay more attention to the environment and they, they urbanize more, which frees up space in uh, the rural areas, which, which can be converted back into forest or a different landscape. But prosperity is the key to human development. It, it isn't trying to turn the clock. And so in this kind of vision, um, if you agree with the half earth proposition, or at least um, maybe even making it a bit more than half earth, um, it would be very, very, very nice to celebrate the diversity of living things and to share the world with um, more living things, or at least a, a greater number of species and more habitats, uh, like, like was the case probably uh, uh, in, a, in, in a sort of slightly healthier past. I'm not convinced. I mean, a, a lot of things have to be factored into this. I would, I would be careful about the kinds of predictions that we make. Uh, throughout the last 40 years, maybe from the 1970s onwards, we've heard numerous doomsday scenarios coming out from respected people. When, when I was an engineering student in 1975, I still remember a lecture, a credible lecture, which said that by the year 2000, we'd have run out of fossil fuels because fossil fuels had been so poorly explored. Now we know that we have that fossil fuels will last us another 100 years. Whether we should burn them is another problem altogether, but the fact is that that resource is now in, almost inexhaustible in practical terms. Um, we have scare stories coming out about massive species extinction, but we haven't seen those species extinctions happen yet. I'm not saying they won't happen. I'm just saying that the predictions were wrong. In the late 1990s, we had this massive scare about the so-called Y2K bug. The, the idea that all the computers in the world would crash when the time changed on the 31, 31st of December, uh, 1999. Absolute scare for no reason. And people have got immune to the idea of being scared repeatedly also by conservation scientists or by conservationists. So you've got to be very careful when you make these, these very strong predictions. I think you have to be careful because otherwise people stop paying attention. When you cry wolf too much, people stop listening. And that's why I think we need to be proactive. We, we need to tackle this uh, at the bootstraps. The, the main thing we need to pay attention to is poverty. I'd, I'd say that if, you want, if, if I had a million dollars to spend, I wouldn't spend it on conservation. I'd spend it on poverty. I spend very, it yes. by, by making people better off because when they're better off, everything else takes care of it. They have fewer children, they, they, they use less land, 
and they're more likely to live in the city. That's what we need. And that's the aspiration of people. If I think about the situation in my own country, in Sri Lanka, if you go to a rural area, I worked in the tea industry for some years, and in the tea industry, for example, it, the tea industry is built around rural people who are working the tea, tea plantations. But when you ask a young person, a 17 or 18 year old uh, son or daughter of a tea plantation worker, where do you see your future? He doesn't see his future as a tea plantation laborer. He sees his future working in the service industry, behind a counter in a bank, or filling gas in a gas station, or driving an Uber. He's, he's not interested in being a manual worker. And these people have ambitions, they have aspirations to move into an urbanized, modern, service oriented society. So to, to not make that dream come true, and at the same time have the spin off effect of helping biodiversity sustain itself, I think we're, we're losing a trick here. Well, to see, focus on just the animals and forests is, is, a, is, 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 a, is a lost cause, and we've been losing that battle for the past century. That's very, very interesting. I mean, I, I, it, the thing that was coming to my head was uh, David Attenborough's recent film, uh, Life on Earth, uh, where he was talking about uh, how uh, when he was young and starting his uh, wildlife career, or maybe just before that, uh, the, uh, the amount of wildlife uh, covering the, covering the uh, speaking in a rough kind of way was, shall we say, 70%, and the amount of human, human cover, if you like, was uh, 30%. And now, now it's reversed. Now uh, the amount of wildlife uh, covering the uh, global surface is at, at least maybe talking about land is, shall we say, 30% and, and humans 70%. And of course, there's a kind of bemoaning of, of a tremendous loss of biodiversity. I mean, uh, recent reports suggest that since, at least since the 70s, uh, wildlife has declined by more than 50%. Um, so it's never an argument for uh, trying to reverse some of these trends. I mean, also there's this thing about uh, shifting baseline syndrome, which is that uh, we always think about abundance when we were young, whereas we we can we cannot conceive of the amount of wildlife ab abundance that was there at least even a few centuries ago. I mean, I was picking up a report today that uh, uh, there were more uh, fish caught from a single river in uh, in Britain uh, in the, in, eight, in 1800 uh, compared to uh, the the amount of salmon ca caught in all the rivers today. Uh, from Britain. So in this kind of context, I mean, things like passenger pigeons, for example, uh, wildlife has certainly under, uh, undergone a staggering decline. And um, do you think that uh, David Attenborough is whistling in the wind uh, uh, with, with kind of ideas about trying to at least to, 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 to press, a, press a reverse button on these trends? I think it's human to want to do that. We all want to see a better planet, and who doesn't want to see more forest, more biodiversity? Um, I, I, I've invested a lot of my life trying to just rebuild forest on 50 acres of land, converting it from tea back into forest. But that's another conversation. Um, so I, I certainly value that, but I don't think that's where the key to the problem lies or, the, or where the solution lies. The solution lies in making people prosperous enough that they do not need the resources that are being wasted, um, the biodiversity resources that are being wasted. So you don't have to cut down rainforest to grow vegetables. That's, that's my point, that if, if, if we just focus on, on prosperity for people, pulling people out of poverty, I think is the biggest uh, thing we have, the challenge we have left to do. And that's doable to bring people to a, a capita income on purchasing power parity of about eight thousand dollars a year. Um, if, if we can get to that point, and it's not far, it's not difficult, it just means pretty much doubling Sri Lanka's present per capita income. If you have seven percent growth for what seven years, you'll probably get there. So it's not it's not difficult to do. Um, and if you look at China, for example, as a result of economic growth, their environment to record their footprint is being improved drastically. Their carbon emissions have almost peaked from, 19, uh, from 2018. And they're doing innovative things. I mean, would you consider a huge number of nuclear power plants, for example, as being an innovation? But they are an innovation. Chinese are building them. Um, technology is the way we need to look forward. If you look at what was going on, I mean, sorry, I'll start that again. We have this green idea in our heads that the whales we were referring to a little while ago were saved, were conserved as a result of conservation action by well-meaning people, uh, whether it's 
people like yourself or, or other conservation people. But this is a myth. The, the, the biggest uh, use, utilization of African elephants or whales was for products like ivory. If you, if you consider that 200,000 elephants per year were being killed for the ivory trade at the end of the Victorian period, by, by the late 1800s, uh, 200,000 African elephants were dying for ivory alone. But that ivory was quickly replaced by plastics. Now we have really dark thoughts about plastics. When you, when you mention the word plastic, people get annoyed. But the fact is, if we didn't invent plastics and, and roll them out in the way we did, we would have been using other resources like ivory to, instead of plastic. Whalebone was largely used. Uh, whale oil was being used. And the, the reason why the whales came to be conserved was completely an accident because in 1878, they discovered petrol in Pittsburgh or somewhere in the US and the petroleum economy took, took off and the demand for whales products uh, sharply fell. So plastics and petrol are what basically saved the whales in the long term. It was not conservation. I mean, silly people, the Japanese, for example, have been going around harpooning whales of late. Um, but this, this has been minuscule compared with the industrial whaling that took place until maybe the 1920s. But that, that, that whaling industry died simply because it was overtaken by a better technology. So technology, I think, holds the key to a lot of conservation problems. It's just that in our minds, we all have this idea that returning to the time of our grandparents, you just mentioned several times, returning to the 1800s or the 1900s is, is the ideal that we should look for. This is, the, this is the kind of fantasy world. It's not the real world. We're never going back there. Because if you go back there, remember, you have to go back to smallpox and diphtheria and cholera and typhoid and all those things as well. You can't just cherry pick the best of the 1900s, the Dickensian ideal of living in this beautiful house uh, in some posh suburb of London. That is not how it works. Well, I, I you have to take everything that, that came with that age, and most of it is bad. I do agree not, with not you. Not to mention all the, all the horse dung on the streets. Yes. Well, what do you think about the kind of rewilding movement? I mean, it's very interesting that you, uh, the wolf, wolf is returning back, uh, back to Europe to some of its former strongholds uh, in places like Germany. And there's talk about bringing back wolves to Britain. Uh, as even from an aesthetic point of view, don't, don't you think that rewilding has a, a role to play? And if I may also add here, uh, you emphasize the value of technology in assisting possibly uh, wildlife conservation in the future, or technology having a role in helping to reduce uh, the conflict that we're seem to, seeming to have constantly with nature. What about biodiversity as well as a way of alleviating human poverty in yep. some way? It's, it's got a marginal role in my view. That, that's a, a fairly small part. Uh, nature tourism, for example. But these are, these are peripheral issues. I don't think they're central issues. The central issue is about livelihoods. And uh, you might have uh, a few hundred thousand jobs in the biodiversity industry worldwide, but I don't see this as being a major business. I, I think we need to look at industrial development for people as the way forward. And, and at the core of that is energy. And we, again, we live in a very hypocritical kind of environment uh, when it comes to energy, because we have this thing that fossil fuels are bad, just like I said a minute ago that plastics are, what many people think plastics are bad until they stop and think. What did plastics replace? Plastic replaced to a large extent elephants and whales, right? So that wasn't that bad a thing. Of course, plastics have their problems. So we need to clean that up. So the, the story of human progress has been that we take a step forward, we find that there are problems, we take a step back, look in another direction, we find there are problems there. And for each increment of prosperity, betterment that we make, of course, there are problems. We solve the problems and we take the next step forward. That's the way humanity progresses. By trying to turn the clock back, you don't, you don't get anywhere. Well, Rohan, and, and for anybody else listening, I'm really happy to say that we're not having a debate here and we're just having a conversation. Um, mm -hmm. Now, obviously, biodiversity does have a role to play um, in, in food. I mean, a lot of the things we eat uh, come from wild resources, especially things like fish, for example, uh, and also air and fresh water and soil. 
so at least on those grounds, wouldn't you say that biodiversity is actually part of our survival as a species? Of course. Yeah, I think that's obvious. Yes, of course. Right. I'm, I'm not questioning that. I'm saying that when we compartmentalize biodiversity as a separate resource, I think we make a mistake. And we, yes, we, I can't see value in that way of thinking about the problem. There is a problem. We are having a conservation crisis. Of course, I recognize yes. that. I'm not denying that. But I'm saying to look at that in terms of a species survival action plan, for example, is a bit half part. So, because the fundamental yeah. problem that we have is one of poverty. It's 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 solving problems of trades and tariffs. It's it's not. There are big systemic problems that we need to solve to make people more prosperous. And very often we're just looking at little problems, and these are not interesting problems because they're not transformative. They're, they're not going to make a difference to, to biodiversity outcomes. They never have. So Rohan, at the moment, are you working on uh, tropical freshwater fish diversity in Sri Lanka, in a Sri Lankan context, or what kind of organism are you working on right I, now? I'm, I'm, at the moment, I'm in a stage of my career where I'm writing, and um, I'm, I'm taking more and more time to, to write stuff that I've been accumulating for too long. So my current work is on biogeography. I'm trying to write uh, a kind of biogeography contextual text for Sri Lanka, which has never been done. It's funny that we have this island that's meant to be part of a global biodiversity hotspot, and no one's ever really documented its biogeographic context. So this, this is something I've been working on for the past several months, and hopefully we'll be able to put out in the form of a publication of some form in the, in the next year. It's a big job. Mm. Mm. So now, we, yes. Now, um, Rohan, as you, as you might be aware, um, uh, one of the reasons that uh, an independent country like Scotland uh, um, had a union with the United Kingdom in roughly about 1707 was because Scotland was uh, heavily in debt. Uh, huge, huge parts of the world are going to be under severe debt now, thanks to the COVID crisis which means that obviously a certain kind of empire, empire builder will probably start slipping in uh, sooner or later when this crisis is over to start uh, consolidating various uh, debt-trapped countries, uh, including Sri Lanka. Now, Sri Lanka has been part of uh, a kind of imperial network in the past, uh, and it could be part of uh, an imperial network in the future. I mean, we are at the moment seeing a situation where a huge trade agreement has been signed in Southeast Asia, which includes uh, Australia. And I don't really know to what extent China is behind it, but obviously there is more interlinking uh, at, a at a commercial level uh, in Southeast Asia and Australia taking place. Um, is this going to be a problem for Sri Lanka from a conservation point of view? I don't think so. I think the problem is more fundamental than, than debt. I think that is one element. Uh, but that is something that Sri Lanka has lived with, and Sri Lanka's debts are fairly small. I mean, look at debt in a, as a global phenomenon. Um, a few billion dollars. This this is not a not an unmanageable amount. And when you think that as recently as 2005, in the wake of the uh, Asian tsunami, uh, most of Sri Lanka's debt obligations were forgiven with the stroke of a pen. This is not something that can't be repeated. Certainly, I don't see this as a crippling problem for the country. Uh, I think the bigger problem for the country is the inability of our people. Uh, and I, I don't point a finger at the politicians because the politicians can be a manifestation of people. Uh, our people to really see where their future lies. We are stuck in a fairly parochial mindset, um, partly as a result of our colonial history that people feel threatened, they feel that their way of life and their culture is threatened, that their values of Buddhism and Sinhalese culture and so on are threatened. And many of our political decisions are based in defense of those threats, as a result of which we are not the most pragmatic of people. And uh, we, we, we've sunk into a situation which is fairly, fairly grim. So uh, we have a crisis of political leadership. Um, we, you know, it's, it's amazing. I think Sri Lanka has been a republic for the past, what, what, independent of Britain, for the past almost 70 years, more than 70 years. Yes. yes. 
And we still haven't had a head of state who's had a university degree. Hmm. This is a telling indictment on any country. Um, and we've got this huge wealth of university graduates of trained professionals, some of the best doctors and engineers in the world. You go in the WHO in uh, any part of the world, you'll find Sri Lankan doctors working there. But somehow into the political process, we haven't been able to attract the best friends. And we're, we're, we're suffering from that. And it's not the fault of the politicians, it's the fault of the people who elect the politicians. And that's us. Um, and, and in many ways, we've, we've done ourselves a disservice. So to, to look at elements like debt uh, or, or economic growth or something like this, and then to think what's wrong is, is I think, the wrong question. That, that's never going to get fixed if you don't fix the basic thing of people wanting, people knowing what they really want. Yeah, so Rohan, uh, to come to one of your uh, favorite subjects without having to push the, push the button too much, uh, one of the problems that I, I feel Sri Lanka has is that, uh, uh, that the legislation treats uh, the, uh, the government as a kind of uh, owner of the wildlife of the island. You know, it's almost like the government has a kind of copyright on the island and nobody can, nobody can exploit or, or, or take a role in wildlife without getting permission from the government first. That's how most of the legislation has been drafted. Uh, you can't do this without uh, permission. We can't do that without permission. And um, even for local researchers, this is a problem. Do you think that uh, many, many of the environmental problems in Sri Lanka could be solved by engaging more with foreign investments and foreign invest, uh, foreign uh, well, participation in research and uh, other infrastructure projects that, that could involve wildlife? I think there's uh, several sides to that, Rajat. So I think, first off, let's say that research is a, is, is a way in which we ask questions and find answers for them. And this is not a national, uh, cannot be nationally limited. Research is the field of inquiry. And inquiry is something that you should be able to collaborate with anybody in the world to, to do. Uh, this, this I, I can't see that side as ever being regulated. It never should. And countries that have tried to uh, restrict fields of inquiry have just ended up with being basket cases. There's, there's no country that succeeded technologically by, by restricting the way in which people do research. Do so that's that Sri, do, do, you think that, do you think that Sri Lanka is doing that now? No, I'm not. I'm just saying that you can't prosper. So there's that, that's not worth debating. That's, that's not, not an interesting thing. But should the country, should the government be the custodian of biodiversity? For sure it should. It should. And in every, uh, in, in most countries in the world, this is the case, that national resources of every kind, be it petroleum resources or biodiversity resources, mineral resources, should be uh, managed by the government on behalf of the people. This, this is fundamental. Are we over-managing resources in Sri Lanka? Probably, because every post-colonial country does this. This is part of the colonial legacy. Uh, because the, the, the fact is that colonial governments were so greedy for power and for resources, uh, whether it's land or minerals or whatever, that they centralized ownership of all these things. The Wastelands Act in Sri Lanka, for example, led to the government owning, what, 60% of the country? Um, so that's not in the hands of the people. In other words, it closed it off from legitimate development. What happens then is there's such a hunger for land that people go and encroach on the land. And they, they have custody of the land, they use the land, but they don't have a title to the land. And without a title, you've got nothing to transact. You can't go to the bank without a title deed and get a mortgage to get credit, for example, to grow your next round of crops. So it leads to a debt crisis as well as a loss of land, uh, the land resource. So over-management of resources by post-colonial countries is, is commonplace. This is the same problem in India and most of Africa and so on. It, it's a legacy of uh, not just British colonialism, but all colonialism. And then the problem to an extent exists also in Australia and Canada, except the population densities in these countries are so low that they don't face the same problem. It's fine for the government to own most of the land. That, that doesn't cause a problem because there's enough land. So countries with high population densities like, like Sri Lanka, what is the world's biodiversity hotspots? We are the highest probably alongside the Philippines. Um, it, it's, it's a special challenge and it's almost a hopeless challenge. I mean, again, if I was 
if I were Bill Gates, it's something that the Gates Foundation for Biodiversity, I don't think Sri Lanka would be high on my list of priorities because the population is too high. It's, it's not a case for an easy win. I'd be more inclined to put my money in Suriname or Bhutan, Bhutan or some country which has got much lower population, much easier resource to, uh, to deal with. Well, I mean, so one of the things that so many people have found remarkable about Sri Lanka, many, many observers, is uh, just how much biodiversity the island still has under the circumstances. And I think this is probably a testament to cultural values that people have as well of that people don't normally naturally like to go and sort of kill things. So, I mean, isn't it a wonderful thing that there is still some, well, a fairly high amount of biodiversity that's at least visible? It's fantastic. It's, uh, and in fact, just a few days ago, I was uh, being told uh, a story on ethics where some sailors, four sailors, were uh, in a life raft and had to face the horrible choice of having no food and to kill one of the sailors for the other three people to eat. This is a true story from the 19th century. Um, and there's a similar story about uh, some Sri Lankan army uh, soldiers who had to, in an emergency, somewhere off the East Coast in 1990, late 90s, I think, Clamber onto a boat and escape to sea to avoid an LTT attack. And they got, they drifted out into the middle of the Bay of Bengal. And they could have killed turtles and eaten them. And they didn't even have to go near cannibalism. But even to kill and eat a turtle, their reverence for life was such that many of them died rather than do. So this is how deeply ingrained the value for life is in Sri Lankan culture. It's, it's something that very few other societies in the world would have. To refuse to kill and eat an animal and die instead is something remarkable. It probably isn't a great story from the army's perspective because they'd much rather that, that soldiers knew how to survive in such circumstances. But even if they knew how to survive, they wouldn't do it because they had reverence for life. So I think we have a huge asset in Sri Lanka in, in many places. Uh, village people would conserve a, a species the moment they know it's important. I described a species of a small fish called Pontius bandula somewhere in the 1990s, early 90s. Uh, in a, uh, only found in a few kilometers of stream near one village in Galapitamala. And once village people became aware that only they had this fish in their neighborhood, they conserved that with a zeal that you cannot find in any conservation out there. Mm. organization. This is, this, this is ordinary people in the local village who are aware that there's an unusual fish in their, in their stream. It's a little stream. You can, you can walk across it about three meters wide. It's, it's not a big deal. You can probably jump over it um, in this stream. And the, and the local people conserve that absolutely with passion. And they don't get any help from the government and so on to do this. There's been conservation agencies and university Professors like like Devaka Virapon, for example, who've gone to the village and, and helped them think and taught them the basics of conservation. But by that time, the local people were already conserving the species. They wouldn't allow anyone to come and collect it and so on. So people have this in their DNA, uh, yes. reverence for life in Sri Lanka. This Rohan, is that's something that's a wonderful story. So, that's true. Well, I mean, you see, um, so. I mean, Sri Lanka isn't probably the same as places like Suriname, where there is far more biodiversity uh, in, in terms of human population. So is one of the reasons for maintaining and uh, uh, talking about biodiversity and promoting biodiversity in Sri Lanka is, uh, is because the, the island is totally unique in many, many respects. I mean, people like Gehan has emphasized how unique the island is in certain respects, you know, like the, seeing all these big mammals in a short time, that sort of stuff. Uh, do you think that this is at least one reason for considering Sri Lanka as a special situation at some level? It doesn't really interest me. I hate to say it, you know, my good friend. No, that's, fine, but but that's, not a problem that, that's not a problem that interests me. I'm more interested in looking, for example, if you just take Google Maps and you look at the forested areas of Sri Lanka, look at the area around Noradia, uh, peak wilderness. These are rich rainforests, right? Haggala. If you look on Google Maps of these areas, you'll see that all the native forest has been lost or is being lost. Massive 
encroachment into the forest. That is irreversible. That is irreversible in the time frame of centuries, not years. You cannot unwind the clock on that, right? So talking about tourism in this framework to me is really boring because there are much more urgent problems. I mean, God bless tourism, I'm happy for it to carry on and so on. I'm not saying anything against it, just that it doesn't interest me personally. I think the problems that interest me are the ones that are more urgent that need to be solved. Um, and, and that's why I'm, I pay more attention to, to those issues than, um, for example, how we can restore rainforest again. Um, I'm pretty convinced now that you can't, but at least we had to try that experiment. So for 20 years, we did this experiment on looking at restoration methodologies, and now I'm convinced that in the wet zone, especially in the highlands, it can't be done. So the urgency is that much greater, because if you cut down a tree in the hot and plains, you, you find that that tree very often is centuries old, and it's not going to come back ever again. So I'm, yes, yeah, so it's a, in, uh, well, I mean, I think it's worth contemplating this, this situation. Uh, now, Rohan, you don't seem to be the kind of uh, uh, author who's um, that keen to promote uh, his publications and books. I mean, you don't really go on uh, book tours and uh, give lots of interviews about your books or have uh, signing celebrations. Um, so, and it will be absolutely amazing to be able to talk about some of your books and the contents therein. Um, why, why is it that you don't necessarily want to promote books? Are you simply uh, leaving a legacy as it were, rather than as it were trying to turn it into something commercial? It's never been about money. Uh, I've never made money from any of the books. In fact, we've spent huge amounts of money uh, on these books. But I think they can be transformative. The three books I'm most pleased about. Um, around 1992, we published a book by Sarath Kapuraman, uh, originally illustrated by Prutu Fernando on the birds of Sri Lanka in Singhala called Sri Lanka Kuroli. That book sold 12,000 copies. Hmm. Had we got funding from donors to give a copy to every staff member in the wildlife department and the forest department, so 2,000 copies were given to everybody in that department. And this is a book in Singhala. After that, Savitri Gunatilaka and Nimal and uh, uh, Mark Ashton and so on published uh, Sri Lanka Gaskola, a, a book on the trees and shrubs of Sri Lanka, helping you to identify from very simple drawings and uh, photographs and illustrations, um, almost 700 species of Sri Lankan trees and shrubs. Uh, Ruchira Somavira did the, the reptiles, the snakes of Sri Lanka, a fantastic book in Singhala. Kalum Manamendra Arache and I did uh, the, the amphibians in Singhala. Big book, maybe five, six hundred pages in technical detail. And now, 30 years, 25 to 30 years later, we have a generation of Sri Lankan youth who are absolutely literate in biodiversity science in consequence of this. And that's the pleasure I get from it. This is not about money. Those books were largely sold at a loss because they, I mean, a hardcover 500 page book was sold for maybe four or 500 rupees. And, and putting this literature in the vernacular, in the hands of school children, because many of these books we gave to school libraries free of charge, had a transformative effect. And the greatest pleasure I get is sometimes going to a place like the, the, the National Park and seeing an old thumbed volume of singer of one of these books being used by a young person and them identifying birds or identifying uh, reptiles or amphibians from these. So I think that that is, was a monumental achievement. The, the books we published in English were intended to make the money that funded the, the low cost Sri Lanka uh, singular editions. And that, that was, I, I think, a, a fun thing to do. I wish I could continue uh, doing it, but I think we did four titles like this, the ones I mentioned, and um, I, I was hoping that other people would take it up and, and do it, and I'm sure it's been done. The quality of even video uh, making recently, if you look on YouTube on Sri Lankan biodiversity, there's some fantastic uh, work that's been done by young Sri Lankans, and, and many of them now are, are professional biologists. So, but the, the, 
So maybe the story is moving forward. Maybe I'm not misrepresenting you in uh, detecting a hint of optimism there. I'm very optimistic. Oh, that's just amazing. To I'm hear. very optimistic. I'm, I'm, if, I'm, if I'm pessimistic about anything, it's, it's just that I'm, I get annoyed by the environmental lobby. And, and I, one of the biggest things that annoys me is when people refer to me as an environmentalist, because I think environmentalists tend to be very unrealistic people, uh, by and large. The green movement globally has been a huge disservice to to environment, um, to to my mind, because they focus on the wrong things and this 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 pervasive idea that you must roll back the clock to the 19th century is so profoundly ignorant that it worries me. I I, I don't subscribe to that. I think okay. progress, humanity is about progress. Yes, yeah. it's not about regress. So Rohan, I would really like to have the opportunity of uh, maybe talking to you, at least maybe following on from some of your books or any publications that come out. I feel that yes, this kind of modern day technology uh, does offer other channels of communication apart from uh, uh, books as well. And um, it's just absolutely wonderful to have such an amazing collection of books and as something of a historian. I absolutely, totally, you know, I can't really praise some of some of the books that, that have, you know, more, more highly. and. Uh, I wish you well for the moment and thank you very much uh, for this conversation. Uh, thank you, Rajat. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Let's catch up sometime and, uh, and say some more controversial things.